couldn't be possibly be more honored or more thrilled to have Alan Mandel, who's absolutely an uh, extraordinary force in LA theater, as well as an actor who's worked with Beckett and who is uh, one of the founders of the San Francisco Actors Workshop. So please welcome Alan Mandel. Thank you. Thank you. For a little while now, you've, you've been an actor. Where did you, where did you start? Uh, I grew up in Toronto. The very first play I did was at the elementary school I went to. I played uh, Oliver Twist, and I, I never stopped. And that was all I ever wanted to do, which was very difficult, particularly for my father, to get uh, used to. When I was about 17 or so, and I was having trouble at the high school I was at, and he sat me down and said, we have to talk about what, are you, what you're going to do with your life. And I said, uh, well, Dad, I, I really want to go into the theater. And he looked at me in like beady eyes and said, a nice Jewish boy goes to the theater. <laughs> Shays Hippodrome, which was not far from where we lived, and I used to go there. I practically lived backstage. And I remember meeting um, a lot of the vaudevillians, including Donald O'Connor and his family, the wow. O'Connor family, they toured. He was about 10 or 11, and I was maybe 8 or 9. He, but he was very worldly. He was, and he spoke to me like I was a child. And he was, he was not much older than I was. And it wasn't until sometime in my uh, 60s, I guess, uh, mid to late 60s, that I decided that I wanted to take tap. Yes. Yes. And so that's what I've been doing. I, ta I take tap dancing. As you're approaching 70, you sit down, you begin making your bucket list, right? right? And at the top was uh, 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 tap, dancing. tap dancing. I mean, I sort of grew up with all of that, you know, right. Donald O'Connor, Shirley yeah. Temple, I mean, everybody. Tapping was, you know, a <laughs> big thing. And I love it. And I go, and I think it's a great thing to do. Uh, and I think actors should do it. Uh, and writers, too, because it has to do with rhythm. The big thing was radio, radio drama. And I got involved in that in my late teens. You walk into a studio, they hand you a script and say, you're John and you're married to her, and there's a, an argument going on, and suddenly you pick up the script, they say, you're on the air, and then you would do it. You'd look and you'd practically memorize the page as you turned it. I mean, you got used to it. I think I did maybe, over that period of several years, maybe 1,500 radio shows, so I got very skilled at doing this. Then there was a, uh, a theater company there. Uh, they were doing a play, it was uh, Maxwell Anderson's Journey to Jerusalem. One of the people who was playing a Roman centurion dropped out at the last minute. I said, well, I haven't done very much stage, and these were all very skilled actors. And uh, they said, oh, we'll work with you, you know, you've got four days in which to do this part. I stayed with that theater which became Theatre 49 in 1949. So during the war you were in Toronto as an actor? Yes. Oh, I see. The company asked if I would take over oh. and run the company. And I said yes. And so you must have come some distance from that Roman centurion at that I point. I came a long way <laughs> from that. Yes, so I, I, uh, I became the artistic director of uh, Theatre 49. I had a sister who was living in San Francisco and she said, why don't you come out for few days or something. I'd never been out of Toronto, not really, you know. And I said, I said you know, I really, is there a, a theater here, a place where you maybe a kind of workshop where you can do scenes or something? I, I really miss it. I mean, after two or three days without theater, I couldn't. And then she said, well, there's a place called the Actors Workshop. And this is how it happened. I went down there and uh, they had, it was a reconverted garage on Elgin Street in San Francisco. Elgin Street. And uh, Jules Irving and Herbert Blau were the artistic directors, co-artistic directors, and they were both uh, professors at San Francisco State College. So they weren't there. So I walked in and I rapped on the door and there was nobody answered, right? And I looked around, I kept trying to, if I could find someone, and the phone kept ringing. Well, I, I picked up the phone, I said, hello, and they said, is this the actor's workshop? Uh, and I said, uh, yes, yes it is. <laughs> they said, uh, well, are, are you doing, uh, you're doing the Crucible, we'd like to get tickets. And I said, well, I, the person who is supposed to uh, do this is not here. If you give me your name and, and uh, number, then uh, I'll have them call you back. 
And so I became the uh, business manager <laughs> of the San Francisco Actors Workshops. We had an office, and behind the office there was a cot and a refrigerator. And uh, I lived there for four years. Uh, we were working at the uh, Marines Memorial Theater. And then down the street, there was a movie theater that had gone dark, and we took that over and created a theater called the Encore Theater right, right. in that. Which also was, in the same area. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Herb Blau, brilliant, and, and Jules Irving. They were just the most dynamic, fascinating people you could want to meet. The three of you together were, were the workshop in the core yes. group, weren't right, yes. That's who it was. It was really it was the three of us. So of course this is the beat generation moment. There was an I, interest in, in, in avant-garde plays. Yes, I mean it was because of Blau that we did Waiting for Gondo, right. Brecht's Mother Courage, we did the American premiere. A lot of what seemed to me rather obscure plays and a very political. How did the focus turn to San Quentin to do uh, Beckett? To San Quentin? Well, that was a, a, a phone call from a man named George Poultney. George Poultney was, a, uh, was the equity representative for the Bay Area. And there were not very many uh, uh, equity actors in San Francisco at that time. This is in the 50s, right? So when he wasn't doing that, he was a deputy marshal. So he was taking prisoners from Vacaville to San Quentin to all the prisons and so on. So he called and said that every year at San Quentin they had a variety show and all the acts that were in San Francisco at the time would donate their time and come over and they put on a big variety show nice. in the dining hall. He said, but a number of the inmates had come to them and said, you know, after all this, it, we'd like to, what about having a play? You know, there hadn't been uh, a, a play there since uh, the late 1890s. They said, the only thing is that you can't have any women in the play. <laughs> I said, oh, 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 right. no women, no. And, uh, you can't have a lot of scenery. And I said, oh, yeah, no women, no <laughs> scenery. It does seem to be narrowing yeah. down to a yeah, particular very play. simple. So I, I, I told them, I said, well, we have, we have a play. I said, there are uh, four men and a boy, and there are a couple of rocks and a tree. And, uh, and they described about uh, Lucky, and I said, oh, yes. But they were concerned about a rope, you know, having this rope. And I said, they were, something like that could be worked out. So, so I said, fine, that we would bring this play. And it sounded good. And um, uh, about two or three days later, I got a phone call from the prison saying that, uh, no, this wasn't going to work. And uh, I, why? And they said, well, some of our people, uh, prison staff, had come over and seen the play, and they don't know what it's all about. And uh, if they don't understand it, you can be sure the prisoners aren't going to understand it, you know, and uh, so we, we, we don't think this will work. So I called Herb and Jules and explained that to them, and they said, Herb said, well, uh, see if you can set up a, an appointment with, with the uh, warden. And so he met with the warden, Wilson, and uh, told them what he said the play was about and that this, he could presented in a short speech to the inmates so that they would understand. And uh, Warden Wilson, I think it was, said, uh, he said, all right, he said, I'll let you do this. He said, but I tell you, if they don't like it, he said, they're gonna let you know it in, in a way that you've never seen before. <laughs> he said, and, uh, and there won't be much we can do because they're already here. Uh, <laughs> We, we got in there, the 1,500 inmates, and up on the upper rack were uh, guards with their rifles, you know. It, it, was, it was extraordinary. So, uh, and then we had guards guarding the rope, Lucky's rope. The prison had, they had their own kind of jazz band. They were, there, were playing as the inmates came in, a bunch of guys in blue jeans coming in, and uh, smoking their cigarettes and throwing them up in the air. Herb Blau came down and oh, there was very quiet and, and he talked to the inmates and said, you know, if this play, he said, you know, it's uh, challenging for some people. He said, uh, but it's like your jazz band. He said, you know, in jazz, there is a theme that runs through. He said, and then you take a riff off that theme and then you come back to that theme. So he went back and the play started. And uh, as it turned out, it was a huge success. I mean, I, I, I've never experienced that ever, 
in any production. Lucky's speech stopped the show totally. I mean, they were screaming and stamping and shouting. Oh, they so they weren't just silent all the way through this oh, production? No, no, there was re response throughout. I mean, it was extraordinary. And uh, the San Quentin News uh, wrote a review uh, of the play, and which was uh, eventually sent to Beckett, who had people everywhere who, who uh, saw his work and reported to him. And he said that it was perhaps the best review of the play that had been written. And it was quite clear because what they understood was, they understood what waiting was all about, because that's what they were doing. They were uh, Gogo and Didi. The warden was Pozzo. Mm. And Lucky was the guy on death row. Mm. Were you in San Francisco when you first met Beckett? Well, I, I, I worked with, with the prison for right. about six years, and then right. that's when we were invited to go to uh, Lincoln Center. Right, right, right. And so I left to go to Lincoln Center and turned it over to some other people, the San Quentin thing. Right. And Rick, I worked with Rick Clucci. He was my point man in the prison. And uh, he began, eventually began writing plays. He, and as he said at the time, I always remember he said, he said, Joe, I've, I've never been to a theater before. He said, not even to rob one. So he... <laughs> <laughs> he was an inmate when you first met him. He was, was an inmate. Was he writing yes. plays? <laughs> yeah. was, he, was he writing plays inside? He, he was writing uh, plays inside. This whole program spurred him on to write his own, and you, I remember a play called uh, The Wall is Mama. He formed a group called the Barbed Wire Theater, and it would toured uh, uh, colleges throughout the country, and they wound up in Europe. And uh, because I had introduced them to the work of Beckett, right, he, uh, he wrote to Beckett when they were in Europe and said that he wanted to know if he could get the rights to Endgame Beckett, of course, but this I've been known all about San Quentin and about Rick, said that he wanted to meet with him. So, so you, they. You hadn't met him yet? Though. No. Oh. So he and Rick met, oh, right? I see. And um, uh, he asked, he said to Rick, he said, Well, I'm going to Berlin to do uh, Endgame and Crap's Last Day. Why don't you come and be my assistant? So here was this former inmate who was now Beckett's assistant in Berlin. And Beckett directed him in uh, Crab's Last Tape. And then he said, uh, Rick asked him if he could, would do uh, with the San Quentin group, who was Rick and maybe two or three other people, uh, Endgame. I got a call from uh, Rick. I'm going to be doing Endgame with Samuel Beckett's going to be directing. We're going to open at the Abbey Theater. And uh, he would like you to do Nag. I got a telegram, said, approve Mandel as nag, Samuel Beckett. I got to London, they met me at the airport, and we were in some um, apartment, settled. I was you know, uh, jet lagged and nervous and excited about the whole thing. And uh, the next morning we got in a cab and drove by the hotel to pick up Beckett. And I couldn't believe this. I mean, I was sitting in the cab and he got in and sat next to me and uh, I said, hello. He said, oh, yes, good morning. I, I couldn't, I didn't say anything else. I, I was afraid to say anything. I thought, he'll think I'm an idiot and they'll tell me to get out of here. Uh, so we went to rehearsals and uh, he was working with uh, uh, Rick, who was playing uh, uh, Ham, Ham, and uh, Bud Thorpe who was playing uh, oh. Clove, everybody would come into rehearsal. I mean, there was a theater you know, in this part of London where we were. And I remember uh, Nicole Williamson would come in, um, Albert Finney. All these people were sitting in at rehearsals. I'd never seen anything like this. Usually when you have a rehearsal, you don't want anybody there except the people who are directly involved. And Beckett didn't seem to mind this at all. About the third day or so, he said, well, Alan, he had a slight kind of lisp. Well, Alan, he said, uh, I think we should do the Diagonal scenes. And I said, oh, God. I said, oh, well, Nell, Nell isn't here. 
She says, has to come back from Puerto Rico. She'll be here in a couple of days, right? This is a big crowd. <laughs> and he said, well, he said, uh, well, uh, we'll pull up two chairs. He said, and I'll do Nell and you do Nag. And I thought, oh, <laughs> I'm here and I, I mean, this is it, right? So he pulled up two chairs and we were sitting there. It was here, and you closer, pull your chair in closer, closer, knee to knee, right? And I was sitting there and he started off, he said, you know, you rap on the bin? He says, what is it, my pet? <laughs> Time for love? And I said, were you asleep? And then we did the whole scene, right? And at the end, you could have heard a pin drop. He, he said, you're going to be very good. And I thought, well, you can send me home now because it doesn't get any better than this. I mean, you know, you get, yes, I, I thought I must be one of the very few people who's acted with Beckett, right? And so, Later on, when we were doing um, Waiting for Gatto, and I called it Gatto because that's what he called it Gatto, and I asked him about that, you know, where the name came from, Gatto, and he said, well, it, when he was in the south of France uh, during the resistance, he said, you know, there was a, a Monsieur Gatto uh, there. He said he might have been from that, and then I read something when he worked with Roger Bland when they first did it. And he, uh, who asked him about it, and he said he thought it was from the word, the French word for boot, because of the boots in Waiting for Godot, right? A lot about that. And the French word for boot is Godiot. And so it's either from that or someone and Godot, which is not a, an unusual French name. I had no problem asking him about uh, anything. I mean, he was very available. and. I remember one night when somebody was going to watch soccer games. Other, he was a big cricket fan, and they asked me. What, I, I said, "Well, I was going to go to a chamber concert, you know, that was nearby because my family are quite musical." And he said, "Ah, oh, oh, yes, chamber. It's the highest form." Mm -hmm. And you know, he was a musician himself. He played piano, and he was a mathematician, and. Uh, what mattered, I remember, you know, during uh, Endgame when we were doing it, and I was holding the book, and then he would stop an actor and he would say, oh, he say, did I write it's or it is? He said, because you know it scans differently. Everything was poetry and rhythm, so that uh, Endgame was a, uh, a chamber piece in eight movements, and he marked them in my script. And he did the same thing for me when I was doing Lucky. You know, he, right. he marked the Lucky speech in four distinct Very movements. Important. I was having uh, lunch with uh, Harold Pinter here in LA and uh, at a friend's house. He was telling me that uh, a production of his, of uh, The Caretaker, had gone to New York and he went to see it. He said, it was, it was just dreadful, Alan. It was a really horrible experience. He said, I couldn't take it, I had to leave it. I said, well, what was, he said, well, the pauses, you know, the famous Pinter pauses, he said, they, they, they were endless, endless. <laughs> he said, um, you, know, you can't imagine what the silences were like. I mean. <laughs> no, I said. <laughs> He said to me, he said, well, you've, you've worked with Sam, right? He said, you, you know what a pause is. I said, well, I like, like a beat. He said, yes, yes, it's, it's, it's a musical beat. That's what the pause is, a musical beat. And the silence is a musical rest. Beckett, you said, uh, conducted rather than directed. And yes, so, he, uh, so that when the end of a pause, I mean, you, you do line the end of a pause, he had these long hands. They would come up like that. That was the end of the pause. Pause, right? A silence. That's it. So I always felt that he conducted it rather, you know. Lucky speech had a musical rhythm to it. And, and Lucky has that dance that he... And, and in your version, which we can see online, it, there's the musicality and the, and the yes. physicality is just so different than any, any other 
right. version of that. It, it, Lucky seems to understand everything oh, yeah. he's saying. It is established beyond all doubt that in view of the labors of Fartoff and Belcher, left unfinished for reasons unknown of Testu and Canard, left unfinished, it is established what many deny, that man in posse of Testu and Canard, that man in Essie, that man in short, that man in brief, in spite of the strides of alimentation and defecation, wastes and pines, wastes and pines, and concurrently, simultaneously, what is more for reasons unknown, in spite of the strides of physical culture, the practice of sports, such as tennis, football, running, cycling, swimming, flying, floating, riding, gliding, canadian, kimoji, skating, tennis of all kinds, dying, flying, sports of all sorts, autumn, summer, winter, winter, tennis of all kinds, hockey of all sorts, penicillin and succadania, in a word I resume, flying, gliding, golf over nine and eighteen holes, tennis of all sorts, in a word, for reasons unknown, in feck and peck and pull and clap and, namely concurrently, simultaneously, what is more, for reasons unknown, but time will tell, fades away. I in the 50s, of course, when you were coming up with the, with the, with the uh, San Francisco uh, workshop, uh, yeah. actors in America were obsessed with Marlon Brando and with, 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 uh, with a whole different concept of acting where everything oh, was yeah. psychologized. Right. But you guys doing Beckett and Pinter, and I'm, I'm sure that Beckett did not want his actors to come in and psychologize Lucky or something No, like we that. never talked about that. Right. So, yeah, so was, were you more of a, a musician in a sense coming yes, into a play? Like yes, that? you were talking about, I mean, they were... Uh, End game is the the two in the bin and right. uh, ham in the chair and clove, and so because of that, when you rap on on the bin, it's right. it musical three notes, right? right? And sure. that's those were the sounds. So that was like uh, the uh, the timpani and so on, you know, and and the movement of the feet, you know, all of that. Uh, had to do with the musicality of it, so that's what you, that's how he worked. So he didn't talk to you about motivating actions, no. or no. or the fact that Clove had been beaten by his parents, or something. No, like that. no, you know there would be these little runs, musical runs, uh, you know, and the, the the whole piece is is music. So the actor would take a run quickly through, would just yes. quickly jam through a line. That right. Way. Well, you would do you would do it. Back and forth. I mean, Ham and Clove back and right, forth. Sure. And at one point, because I remember, was that uh, Ham would say, "Well, that was a nice little canter," yeah. and oh, that's yes. what it was, you know, right? right? That's a line, and that's what it was. So that tells you. If you look, you find all these musical uh, uh, in, indications, you know, in, the, that are there in Obviously, the script. Uh, uh, an actor, I'm sure you or, or, or Billy Whitelaw, or any of the actors yes. who worked regularly with him, were ever said, stopped and said, "What does this line mean?" I mean, there's a lot of allusion. I mean, yeah. lucky speeches and, and happy days, rich with allusion to things that were going on in James well, Joyce and, yeah. in, and in other plays and in. And in well, and lucky philosophy. speech is a sort of compendium of uh, of the history of the Western world. Right. A personal God, qua qua qua, outside and so uh, you know, outside time, outside time extension, qua 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 qua. It who seems from the like heights a, like of a, like divine a apathia, divine athambia, divine aphasia, loves us dearly with some exceptions. <laughs> right? So it's that. I mean, it's, it's, it's a little bit of vaudeville. Yeah, so the music is, we got a little bit of vaudeville, right? I mean, that's what, the sort of thing he was interested in. And I found working with Barry McGovern when we did Gaudo here. And uh, the, the Irish do that, you know, There's, they're very musical. And so in, there were sections that we had together where we just were almost singing to each other, you know. And it was, it was wonderful. I mean, it was thrilling to be able to do that. Because, I mean, rehearsals now for Happy Days or play or something, you know, was a, a lot of time is spent with the actors trying to figure out yeah. exactly what each line means. So that you well, there's play. a lot of that you can find, you know, in Happy Days. I mean, there's, there are a lot of uh, poetry in there and oh, I fragments of poems. I fragments of poems. Yes, and I, I would have to look those up. I, when I directed it, I mean, I didn't go to him about that. Another one that was a very music is Rockabye. Right. Rockabye is all music. I mean, you know, when we recorded that first, you know, and because she doesn't speak, it, but but two or three words, right. you know, but it's the rocking chair and and uh, the rhythm of that speech, and so it had to be so. It, and you don't sing it, but it's very musical, and you had to understand, you know, the music of it. 
<laughs> Billy, Billy Whitelaw says that, that in order to do not I, that she ha which is a which is a play in which you just see a mouth yeah. on stage. I think that they had to bind her head and it was very uncomfortable and she actually fainted in rehearsal and so forth and that Becker yes. was very concerned about that. But I don't think he was the kind of director or writer who demanded physical things that were very difficult necessarily of the actors. No, well to give you an example, when I was doing Nag, I was in the, in the bin and I finished the long uh, speech that he, that he has, that Nag has. And I'm, I'm there scratched down in this ash can or oil drum or whatever the hell it was. And uh, the lid is lifted and I look up and it's Sam. And he <laughs> says, uh, you, you, you must get out now. And I said, <laughs> I said, no, I can't. I have to stay until the end. I mean, he's here until the end. He said, oh no, you can't do that. He said, that's inhuman. They, they'll cut out a piece in the back of the bin and then you can get out. He said, you can't stay in there. And I thought, isn't that wonderful? Yes, yeah. that's very good to hear. Yes, he, he, he <laughs> Not all directors are like that. No, <laughs> and he, he, he helped me out of that bin, and I thought, my God, I did it in, in San Francisco, and I had to sit in that bin. Oh, so you would already room. had the experience. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. You toured in several productions directed by Beckett, is that right? And, um, yes, we toured uh, throughout Europe, and, and I remember in uh, Rome afterwards, a, a, a lot of the... The people in the audience came backstage. They had their, they had their scripts, they were, and they said, "Oh, you, you, you missed a section here," and I said, "No, no, no." You see, Beckett cut that. Hmm. Beckett, he made a cut. I said, "Yes, he, he often, Beckett had made a cut. Hey, Beckett made a cut." <laughs> you know, I, 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 I was, they, they were just astonished. But he did that when he worked. You know, he, he was always changing mm -hmm. things, eliminating, eliminating, tightening. He came out of a rehearsal and I said, you, you cut one of my favorite lines. And he said, oh, I did really, what was that? And I said, well, when Pozzo has the pipe, he takes it and he says, the second is never as sweet as the first. And he said, oh, oh yes, he said, you really, he said, but I've left you some others that you like. <laughs> I resume, follow Clapham, in a word, the dead loss. Head, since the death of Bishop Barclay, being to the tune of one inch four health per head, approximately by and large, more or less, to the nearest decimal good measure round figures, stark naked in the stocking feet in Connemara. In a word, for reasons unknown, no matter what matter, the facts are there. And considering what is more, much more grave, that in the light of the labors lost of Steinweg and Peterman, it appears what is more, much more grave, that in the light, the light, the light of the labors lost of Steinweg and Peterman, that in the plains, in the mountains, by the seas, by the rivers, running water, running fire. The air is the same, and then the earth, namely the air, and then the earth, and the great cold, the great dark, the air, and the earth, a boat of stones in the great cold. Alas, alas! <laughs>